And this video is sponsored by 3D Realms. 3D Realms next game, Phantom Fury releases on April 23rd. The independent video game scene has exploded over the last decade with first person shooters aiming to recapture the feeling of playing Doom or Quake on a Pentium in the mid 90s. Games with sprawling, maze-like level design, hunting for key cards, and littered with secrets, this style, often referred to as being a Doom clone, at least until the term FPS was coined, has surged in popularity since the release of Dusk and a Medieval in the mid 2010s. However, much like the market for shooters in the late 90s, the modern boomer shooter market is getting fatigued with the Doom style mold, and something more theatrical is attempting to take its place. In the same way that Dusk and New Blood led the charge on a Doom revival, 3D Realms and Slipgate Ironworks' Phantom Fury are set to lead the charge on a new type of boom shoot. One more linear, leading the player from one set piece to another, heavily inspired by games such as Half-Life. These games are harder to make and require far more skill with animation and narrative, yet still require some of that original boomer shooter DNA in order to remain competitive. Phantom Fury is a wholly enjoyable homage to the linearly designed FPS of the late 90s like Sin and, again, Half-Life. Sin in particular, Ritual Entertainment's 1998 release that was overshadowed by Valve's Half-Life, as Half-Life was only released one week after Sin, is Phantom Fury's main inspiration. Many, myself included, will continue to draw comparisons to Half-Life. It's similar with its environmental design and choice of locations. However, at its core, this feels like a spiritual successor to Sin, going so far as to link the narratives of both games with a cameo of Sin's player character, John Blade near the end of the campaign. The good parts of Sin, by the way. After finally taking the time to finish Ritual's classic, I can confidently say Phantom Fury has nothing akin to the chemical plant forced stealth section. There's only one single part of the game where stealth is an option, but it is not required at all. Also similar to Sin, levels mostly take place in between passages of time. Only a handful of levels see direct transition between loading screens. For the most part, these levels are self-contained missions, again, very akin to Sin. So to prepare for this video, I played a lot of 3D Realms games. First, I actually played Sin for the first time. Next, I 100% completed Ion Fury and its expansion Aftershock. Last, I played Phantom Fury twice, once on medium and another on the hardest skill, getting all achievements and 100%ing progress in the process. I did not replay Half-Life this time, I did not see the need to. Shelly Bombshell Harrison has become somewhat of Three Realms' new mascot, and now has starred in three complete games. While Ion Fury channels the essence of build engine classics like Blood or Shadow Warrior, Phantom Fury is a far flashier game, attempting to tell a road trip story intertwined with corporate and government espionage. However, similar to its previous entry, Phantom Fury's story is really only there for those who want to experience it, as it's almost entirely optional. Aside from a few unskippable cutscenes, which I hope a patch in the future will allow skipping those, almost all of the story is fed through emails on usable computers and phone calls with some of the game's main characters. To quote id Software's co-founder John Carmack, quote, story in a game is like story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not important, end quote. Phantom Fury seems to live by this classic sentiment, and I appreciate that it seems to mostly respect the player's time, as this game is shockingly lengthy but in a good way. My first playthrough clocked in at over 13 hours. Phantom Fury sees the player completing 18 levels of varying length, with an average playtime per level of about 45 minutes. Some are much shorter, and a few are way longer. I enjoy the creative variety of these level designs. Instead of each of them following a pattern of point A to point B, levels differ in goals and sometimes play with nonlinearity in shorter chunks. Some levels drop you in large, open spaces with multiple points of interest, and the player can take care of them in any order. Weapons continually appear, always adding an extra layer of choice in combat. With a total of nearly two dozen weapons of varying usefulness, with weapon functionality expanding with upgrades, almost all of them acting as unique weapons on their own, the choice is vast. But some weapons are far more useful than others, such as the Lover Boy, Shelly's massive revolver, able to auto-aim snipe any enemy in sight even from across the map. I do think this should be reined in a bit. If you played the Steam Next Fest demo last year, you likely felt that the combat was disappointing due to a lack of enemy feedback, weapon feedback, and just a general overall lack of polish. 
After finishing the campaign the first time, I went back to play that demo. It was night and day. Everything related to combat has been improved in some meaningful way. Weapons feel punchy, enemies react to damage, and many of the major critiques that the community had of this game have been addressed. The Loverboy shows icons of seen enemies. You can shoot drones when they've been downed to have them explode quicker and act as free grenades. Enemies have chatter and communicate with both the player and each other. The Mega Punch is a single button press. Enemies can gib. It's a significantly better experience and turns Phantom Fury into Slipgate Ironworks best game by far. Movement was also a surprise, as the overall game feel has improved a shocking amount. Basic player movement feels smooth, responsive, and just speedy enough to not bog down exploration. Combine the movement with the classic crouch jumping, along with the excellent addition of Shelly's Mega Punch, which will lock onto an enemy and leap long distances to meet its target, and you have something akin to the first two levels of Doom Eternal movement-wise. This leads me to believe that speedruns would be fun, especially with physics object boosts that I have been able to figure out and play around with. A multiplayer deathmatch arena or horde mode would be a welcome addition. This movement fits that kind of game. The art, environment, and level designs are the high points of this game for me though, and it's obvious that those who worked on these specific aspects wanted to make something special. While the art goes for a pseudo-retro look with pixelated textures and blocky models, its mixture of modern lighting and environmental effects makes certain levels pop, standing out in a sea of two 5D homages on the Steam Store. The design of these levels is fantastic, and it's no wonder either, as 3D Realms contracted out some of the level designs to some of Half-Life's modding scene's best mappers, and it shows. Exploration is rewarded with upgrade points that allow the player to expand their abilities on both their person and their weapons, and searching around every little corner of the levels allows the player to become far more powerful way earlier. How these designers hid some of these secrets is great, and although the secrets are technically unmarked, the level design across the board is my favorite part of this game by far. On the flip side, enemies are just as varied. Many of the levels contain unique enemies themselves, while the same cast of a dozen or so also mix in as the game progresses. Bosses also dot the campaign, with some far more difficult than others. Honestly, the first half feels pretty balanced and actually kind of easy, while the second half cranks the heat up like crazy. When playing hard, this game will deliver a difficult experience, especially when it comes to bosses and ambushes. Most enemies have higher skilled evolutions the player will meet throughout the campaign, replacing pistol using grunts with shotguns, replacing little zombies with big zombies, and then again with little zombies riding on the backs of big zombies. Again, the game turns up the heat. It's not as hard as playing Ion Fury on Maximum Carnage, but it's up there with playing Half-Life on Hard. However, most of the time, it does actually feel like the deaths are the player's fault, unlike Half-Life on Hard. The game goes on for a surprising amount of time, with a major plot point in the middle feeling like a conclusion, only for the story to twist and go in a completely different direction. The twist is quick and dramatic, and allows the locales of levels to change in such a way that the runtime isn't felt negatively. The level with the power-changing puzzles and horror elements, along with the level taking place in the Android Factory, are my standout favorites due to their inventiveness and willingness to experiment with the formula seen in a few other levels. We also have vehicle sections, and generally, the Half-Life and Half-Life 2 inspirations are felt most in these vehicle levels. Obviously, this is a sponsored video, so some may not take what I have to say about this game seriously, so let me be real for a moment. I enjoyed my time with this game. It's clear that the people who worked on it cared and wanted to make something special, echoing not only the classics such as Half-Life and Sin, but attempting to create Shelley's own Duke Nukem Forever, and on most fronts it succeeds where DNF didn't. You never know what the general public will think or latch onto, but here and now, writing this days before the launch, I wholeheartedly recommend this game to anyone who enjoys the Half-Life formula that was solidified back in 1998. And thank you so much for watching this video, and again, thank you 3D Realms for sponsoring my content. We'll be back to regularly scheduled programming as soon as possible, but in the meantime... So check out Phantom Fury when it releases on April 23rd, link down in the description below. My Discord server invite link is down in the description below, as is my X page. And if you're at all interested in the 90s PC gaming scene, I've got another channel, The Passionate Gamer that actually has a bunch of archival recordings from the late 90s of a forgotten television show called The Passionate Gamer. I have a clip of it right here. Somebody just asked to get a tour of my computer. 
And I guess we haven't done that today, so I guess we can. Yeah, so this is the setup. It's got a NVIDIA GeForce 2, uh, the new model. It's got CD burner, DVD drive. This is a Zip 100 drive. There's my Palm Pilot, this is my controller, Dragon Ball stickers. Um, and this is my this is my gaming room. So if you're at all interested in checking something like that out, link to that also down in the description below. I'm Tyler McVicker, the passionate gamer. I'll talk to you all next time. Peace and air grease. Adios.